Mike, welcome to the Z Learning Podcast. Thank you so much for stopping by. Hey, thanks for having me. Really excited. My pleasure. So, Mike, for my audience that doesn't know you, uh, just if you could quickly summarize a little bit about what you do. Uh, yeah, I essentially make good trouble. Um, I uh, work in innovative education. I was a traditional teacher for a little bit and decided that wasn't for me very quickly, bounced around from public, private, charter school, um, and I ended up uh, being in somewhat of a dream situation um, in a micro school in Austin, Texas called Alpha, where we had essentially an unlimited budget to do and explore whatever we wanted. Um, ended up doing a lot of really cool things with that school. Some things I can talk about, some things I cannot talk about because uh, it was school, software development company, software acquisition company, kind of all rolled into one thing. Uh, so really fun project, probably the best place to explore if you're interested in like poking at education. Um, but once I had like learned what I had learned there, I got essentially tired of building schools for the wealthy elite. Uh, so then I went to, um, I thought about like, what's the biggest education organization or organization that's not purely education, but has an education arm. And so I was like, my, my sites were aimed at Google for education. Um, but before I could ever apply or, or really meet anyone there, uh, I met someone from this, um, organization called the reinvention lab that is a, like a little startup inside of teach for america which is the largest education nonprofit in the u.s and um ended up going to work with her at the reinvention lab so i'm i've been at the reinvention lab for uh, it'll be two years in october um basically just trying to build innovation at teach for america which is somewhat of an old and antiquated um uh, organization as well very cool so when you say build innovation at teach for america is this like uh, bringing more technology into education? Is this bringing some of the same tech resources that you might have at these elite prep schools and charter schools to, you know, more places or, or um, yeah, like what, what kind of things I guess you're doing um, to create more innovation in education? Yeah, somewhat. I think like it's a little bit of everything, um, uh, but uh, technology certainly plays a role. Um, it's it's very important to me specifically as an innovation. Is, is no, no matter how many people say, um, which is, this is very popular in sort of like education reinvention circles, when they say like, oh, you know, innovation is not just technology. It's certainly not just technology, but technology, I argue, is the biggest, most fascinating and fastest way to innovate anything right now in the world. Mm -hmm. um, it is the most important thing um, in business, in economics, in uh, real estate, in education, like basically everything. It's disrupted so, uh, every industry, especially mine, marketing. You know, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Abs I mean, the, the digital transformation, digital revolution, like it's so important. And so I w basically inside of that little reinvention lab, I'm, I'm part of a little studio, a little product studio. There's only me and two other people. Um, and we're building new products, um, tech products, uh, program offerings uh, that could sit right alongside Teach for America's core offering, which is a two-year teaching core model, um, and uh, maybe even replace it if something were to happen to the main thing. Uh, so we're we're on. Sometimes I sometimes it feels like somewhat of a suicide mission, and uh, sometimes it feels like we're on the precipice of like the next big thing. So that that's exciting. So you're you're kind of like an education pioneer. Um, yeah, trying to be. Which, you know, you're in good company on this podcast. Um, you know, a lot of people who've been on here, some of whom are re uh, revolutionizing uh, employee training and skills based right. learning, and some people who are doing um, more like in, you know, school age uh, education. Uh, you know, so one question would be is I see that you have an education background, you're clearly an enthusiast of technology. Um, mm -hmm. Did one come first and the other follow, you know, or was like, um, mm. were you more an educator, but you were also interested in technology or did your interest in technology just follow gradually from your interest in education? Yeah. So one of my interests in education, um, in education with ed tech specifically is, um, the idea of making ed tech careers accessible to everyone. So I grew up in Houston, Texas, and even though Houston is a, it's the third largest metropolitan area in or third or fourth, um, I think third, yeah. I think it's third. Yeah. There's like New York, LA, then Houston. Yep. And so it's a massive city where, where you, you would think you can get just about everything. But when I, when I grew up in Houston, Houston's tech infrastructure was actually lagging behind. Like Houston was, it's big in oil and gas. It's still the major industry there, but oil and gas was very slow to adopt the digital transformation, the digital revolution. So it, 
never occurred to me that working in tech, which was something that I was always fascinated with. Like I, I remember when the iPhone came out in 2007 and I remember sitting in, I was in a, an, an algebra class and my algebra teacher said that the, 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 the same thing that they all say is you have to show your work because you won't always have a calculator with you when you grow up. And I was like, yeah, but <laughs> this <laughs> new thing just came out. And I just remember like knowing that the world was going to change. Um, I remember when I was younger, when I was like in the third or fourth grade, the first time I played Oregon Trail online with somebody who was not in Texas or who was not in the same room with me. Like I was Portland, Maine was where the first I was like chatting with this. He's like, yeah, I'm in Portland, Maine. I was like, yeah. where the heck is that? And so I've always been fascinated with technology. I've always loved technology, but I never saw it as a career path until I ended up in Austin, Texas. I just happened to live in Austin at the right time when that city was trying to become Silicon Valley 2.0. And I am so thankful that I was a part of that ecosystem, um, ended up building an, an ed tech platform uh, that's called Guide, is now a B2B SaaS product. Um, uh, well, yeah, like taking onboarding experiences and making them into micro video. Uh, so had the process like, you know, had, got, got the chance to like build software products while I was in a building a school at the same time. So uh, they, I, I, I guess my love for tech happened before my, my love for school. I uh, never wanted to work in education. My mom, who was a career teacher, told me when I was 18 years old, she said, Michael, never be a teacher. <laughs> Uh, and so I never, I never wanted to work in education. So tech came first, uh, but it's very clear that they need to be married in my life. That's awesome. So, uh, you know, I want to get to your statement that caught my attention on LinkedIn. Yep. Um, you mentioned your frustration with um, technologists who get into the ed tech space that have no educational or pedagogical background. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on, on that and yeah. um, what are some of the problems and how maybe we could solve them? Yeah. So I think f first I should, I should say that I have a, I, I get the unique chance to have a national lens when it comes to education now, especially innovation. Like I work um, for the largest education nonprofit that has more access and dollars than virtually everyone in the field, right? Like like, I mean, now the billionaires are getting into the school game. So obviously not them, but like Teach for America is about as big as it gets. Like they're like, my TFA email has opened up doors that I just would never have imagined would open up. And so when I, I, I had the chance, I've, I've for the past four or five months, as we build new products, I've been traveling the country, conferences, uh, meetups, um, live demos, literally just everywhere trying to figure out where the innovation is, who's doing what. And what I actually saw was, I, I tried to capture it in that post. Um, I, I, was, I, I find myself really disappointed with the state of ed, ed tech right now because, yeah, just like, like you mentioned, um, I, I, I see a lot of ed tech companies that are two thirds of the way through with their roadmap or they're about to launch an MVP or they're about to exit beta and they haven't talked to one single teacher, not one single student. And what's, what's even more, uh, the, I, I wrote that post because what's more frustrating than that is that these companies are being funded. I mean, th these companies are pulling in sometimes, you know, tens of millions of dollars, which in ed tech is like a big deal. Like, and they, they don't have, a teacher or a student's best interest at hand because they're not talking to them. And I, I juxtapose this with one of the companies that I believe is the best of them. Like, like I, I think Clever is the best of them because Dan Carroll went from teacher to tech integration specialist, then saying, whoa, I've been dealing with this problem my whole career. Now let me solve it for them. And then Clever was actually a gateway that opened the floodgates to ed tech in schools right? It was a revolutionary project built by a teacher. Um, so I, when I use Clever as the example, when I, when I look at like the, the Ed3 DAO, like uh, uh, K20, like Vridi, Vridi and, and Michael Cohen, like those people came out of the classroom. And it's not to say you can't build ed tech unless you teach. Teaching sucks, man. I'm not gonna lie. Like I don't, I wouldn't tell anybody like, go be a teacher and then build ed tech. No, but like, like your DAU, your daily active user, 
if they include teachers and students, I don't understand how you can get it, it any length of the way down your roadmap without talking to those people, consulting them, and really giving them a role in building. Um, and then the other thing that I saw that that sort of made me very frustrated, the reason why, why I posted that is because I guess, I guess it would be two more things. It's like one, um, there's a lot of founders who are actually building transformational technology that can't find funding. Um, instead, we're funding things that plug into the current system and that actually, in, in, a, in a way, keep the, the traditional school system the same. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to see any more textbook translation tools or like digital workbooks. I, I want to see adaptive learning software. I, I, I don't know how much I really believe in the eduverse, but I still want to see that. I want to see somebody try to figure that out. Um, and and I, 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 that post came in a moment where a friend of mine um, who I thought was building something so special texted me and said, hey, I'm closing up shop. I'm finally letting go. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I just took all that frustration <laughs> to that post because the reason why she was shutting down her company is because she was like, I'm tired of fundraising. I have a family and I can't keep doing this to them. Not getting funding. Like, yeah. Like nobody should have to deal with that. Yeah. Like, especially people building the right stuff, you know? Right. Right. Most of it's going to the, I guess, the technologist, the startup. I mean, it's interesting, you know, it would, having an ed tech uh, company without consulting teachers, that would be like starting a med tech company and never consulting doctors or nurses. Like that's ridiculous. Exactly. Like, exactly. I can't believe that. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I mean, one question for you would be is uh, you talked about, you got at the heart of something on this podcast we've talked a lot about, about how can we, I don't want to just focus on ed tech and e-learning. I mm -hmm. want to have conversations about how can we change education in general? Yeah. Um, how could we make education better for more people? Um, you know, even in traditional education, I think that e-learning, ed tech can be yep. uh, leading the, the way it should be um, in, in changing it. Um, for the better. So you mentioned, uh, so I guess one question to you, to you would be, um, how could ed tech be part of the solution in not just creating solutions uh, that supplement or help the traditional classroom, but mm -hmm. to actually change how we educate? And two, you mentioned the Edgeverse, so that's kind of part of that. And I saw yeah. li another LinkedIn post of yours where you said an, uh, the, an Edgeverse, Metaverse teaching shouldn't just be um, yeah. a simulation of being in a classroom with rows of desks. So I'm curious, what yeah. is your vision for the future of education? Yeah, thank you. For that. I love that. I love this question because I think about it literally all day. So I think technology play, plays a role in this and that like number, the, the one thing I would advise like anyone building a tech to do is one is talk to teachers, parents, and students and weight the students' voices heavier, even if, even if you disagree with what they're saying because your product will be better. I, I actually, and I'll even throw this out there for you guys. I know of a guy who funds ed tech products and the way that he funds them is he gets a group of kids together over dinner and he's like, what do you think of this? And if the kids yeah. are like, yo, this is awesome. He writes the check. So just throw that. <laughs> and that, that's like a focus group. I mean, yeah. you, you've got to test with your, you got to listen to your customers. You know, your market. Exactly. Exactly. And it's like ed tech is so unique because oftentimes your end user is not your paying customer. Um, and the True. other thing is like, if you think about, uh, think about TikTok, think about so social media apps in general, social media apps are really interesting to me because the users often tell you, they tell developers how the app will ultimately be used, right? Like um, TikTok is a great example in that, like it used to be musically, and they like, oh, lip syncing videos is like, that's what we want. They I was into it then. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, but they launched TikTok. And then all of these CPAs get on there. And they're like, let me teach you about money in one minute. Now, all of a sudden, TikTok is a search engine, which, by the way, I want to say that I said this three years ago. Everybody's saying it now. And I was like, TikTok's a search engine. And people attacked me on LinkedIn. They were uh -huh. like, no, it is not. Uh, but, I mean, I'm surprised because um, Pinterest, YouTube, well, obviously YouTube, but like yeah. Pinterest, um, you know, Facebook, they, Instagram have become search engines even before. So right. I, mean, that, I would have expected that, but I guess not everybody's like following like social media. And yeah. 
and TikTok was the one where that like it had such a bad rap because they were like, oh, it's just little girls on there dancing, until the explanations of the algorithm started to come out and people were like, well, what are you liking and watching? Well, that's <laughs> what's that. Well, right. I mean, that's also that's how it always starts. You know, it yeah. starts with you know Snapchat's just kids sending nude selfies and then it became exactly. like news and all these other things yeah and now we have spectacles like the the I, I have two pairs of them back there like um you know so i i think you know social media is unique in that like users ultimately define how that app is used mo most most often you know developers tend to read and react to what users want linkedin is actually for the first time i think in its history doing a really good job of listening to creators um, and I, and I say this as a person who, um, over a year ago, a friend of mine, uh, Quentin Allums and I, we, we, we posted like, Hey, where's all the black creators at? And LinkedIn was like, Hey, well, let's build something together. Right. So like that, that's an example of like how so they're they, listening. That's great. Yeah. They're listening and they're malleable. Well, education technology is not like that. Um, it, it is, it is like, we built this for a specific purpose and we need you to use it that way because it works. Um, and we have not yet had enough ed tech founders allow their platforms to be shaped and molded by students. Um, there is a, I want to give a shot. There is a, a platform called Ori, which is a public speaking. It's a virtual public speaking coach. And most of their business is like fortune 500 companies. They also have this phenomenal tool, by the way, that's like a, it sits on the top of your desktop and it takes all of your meetings and it's a one click join. Like, very That's great. It's called Ori Meetings. Mean. Yeah, it's very good. I I'm recommend it. Looking this up. Okay. Yeah. Look at. I mean, this app Ori though is so great because you speak into it, and then in less than one minute, it gives you AI-based feedback, tone, pause, all oh. of that. Um, so you can make data-driven changes to the way you present. Basically. Right. That's awesome. And so I was building a public speaking program at this hyper innovative school called Alpha. And um, I was like, I need to find the best tool. And or I found it often, I found tools that were not um, marketed towards education because I knew that if it was a new startup that was not marketed towards education, the relationship between students and that founder would be different. What I love or I so much for is that uh, Donish, the founder, flew from Philadelphia to Austin, Texas, had his or I shirt. And he walked into the building and by the time he got, like by the time he actually flew down, so many kids at that school had used the app to where they saw the logo on his shirt and they were like, wait a minute, are you the, are you the guy? Did you make that? And he's like, yeah, that's me. And they, he was like a local celebrity. And they said, like, what are you here for? And he was like, oh, well, I'm just, I'm just here to listen to you guys. I want to uh -huh. know what you guys want. And the, the, I watched an eight year old and an 11 year old and a 13 year old say, hey, what if you had this in the app? What if you had that in the app? And what was more unique about that was that two, three weeks later, those features were in the app. Wow. Is this the and same the, guy who was having, listening to the kids over dinner talk about no, it? Well, same school, uh, but uh, di different guy. Um, Love it. So, wow. So these are people who really are listening to their customers, to the users who maybe aren't their customers, as you said, because the customers, I guess, are school districts, teachers, right. parents. But yep. um, the, they're really listening to their little users who are making a huge difference. Exactly. And I, I think that the biggest thing, the most important thing that an ed tech company can do is listen to the users to build a better product. Um, Newzella did some of that. IXL did some of that. IXL basically learned that students want global leaderboards. So they, you know, and IXL is essentially a digital workbook. Um, and what's that for my listeners who don't know? What's a global leaderboard? Oh, it's it's just a, a leader. Basically, if I'm in Texas, I can see, like like you're in New York, right? You're in Brooklyn, right? Uh, like, Queens now, yeah. Oh, Queens. Okay, yeah. Um, oh man, I gotta tell you a story about the first time I went to Jamaica Queens, and I. Oh, and right nearby. So Actually, my address comes up as Jamaica sometimes. So I don't know why. Yeah, I was I was I'm such a Texan because I, I got there and I was like, whoa. Like there's like a lot of Jamaican people, and this lady was like, "Why do you think we call it Jamaica Queens?" And I was like, "That's hilarious." Sorry, ma'am, I've never been here before. <laughs> but uh, I had a great time there. But um, but like like let's say we're both doing that app. We're yeah. both doing math in this app. We can see on this leaderboard how many minutes you have, how many minutes I have, how many lessons I've completed, all in live time. Yeah. And so they found a way to, uh, you know, 
take something, borrow something from the gaming world um, and, and put it into learning. That's and so to, to get to the, the question you asked earlier about the metaverse, that's what I hope it is. I hope the metaverse is just borrowing and stealing from the gaming world. Yeah. Um, I, I've been rambling on about the in, in lots of different places, but I think Grand Theft Auto 5 online has already figured out the formula for school in the metaverse. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so gamification of education. That's yep. another topic that's come up on this, this show a lot. Um, you get into that a little bit? What, why do you think yeah. that's the best? I, I actually, the gaming industry is, I, I used to tell when I would consult with schools, I would say the first thing you need to do is hire a game designer to build your projects. And they would say, whoa, I don't know. Why would I do that? And it's like, well, because game designers have figured out how to keep the attentions of children and adults for extended periods of time, That's sometimes right. with very little payoff. Like one of the, the gaming communities that I'm fascinated with is uh, the, 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 the Madden community. Mm. Uh, so uh, everybody hates this game. <laughs> like, I, I see all these YouTube videos are like, this is the worst game ever. The new one they looks try. almost like you're really watching the game. Like it's crazy. The, it looks so realistic. <laughs> Compared I to, say, I remember I, back in the day, like, <laughs> yeah, like I got to beta test the new one. It's really good. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, and my friend, he like, I guess he pre-ordered it or something. Or, I don't yeah. know. Like, yeah. As a person who's like played video games for a long time. And I think some of it is like the, like a lot of these people on YouTube are, that are like, this game sucks. It was like, you just didn't play Madden 05 or Madden 95. You just, you just don't right, know. Right, right. <laughs> they just <laughs> you know? discovered this yesterday. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but if you, but if you think about video games, like, like they, they've got the introduction of like, they figured out motivation. They figured out, um, how to capture attention. They've even figured out collaboration in ways that the school system has not yet figured out collaboration. I, I always tell this story. Um, uh, there, there is a guy, uh, his name is Lowrider 18. And I, I used to hate Lowrider 18. Um, I would jump into Grand Theft Auto five and play. And he had this like this hover bike. If you play Grand Theft Auto Five, it's an oppressor Mark II. And he used to blow like he would blow me up at random. And I felt like I always ended up in sessions with this guy. Like you could end up in a session with anybody, and you'd never really know who they are. But I was like, this guy's always he lowrider eighteen. He is always blowing people up for no reason. I hate this dude. And uh, I there are all all these missions in the game, and some of the missions, actually a lot of them, you cannot do them without another player. And so I, I, I'm trying to finish this mission. I come up on, uh, on one where I've got to do it with another player. And I do this random auto invite. And there he is, Lowrider18. Oh. is in my, And so we do this mission. And Lowrider18 is a much higher ranked player than me. You can see that because he's ranked like 380. And I, at the time, I was like 60. Right. And so we go through this mission. And I'm like, we're, we're, we're doing our thing. We finish the mission and it, the game gives you the ability to send a text message to another player. Like, and it's like, you see, see it on the phone and he sends this text message and he's like, respect, join my crew. <laughs> and so now we're on the same crew. Me and Lowrider 18 are on the same crew. Shout out to Lowrider 18. Yeah, yes. <laughs> whoever you are, Lowrider 18. Uh, Lowrider 18 is probably some like 14 year old, like wizard <laughs> at a because Lowrider 18 is the real deal at Grand Theft Auto 5 online. But like it, I was fascinated by that interaction. And the only reason why I started actually playing this particular game is because I had a student that was like, hey, you remember all that crazy stuff you talk about with school? Like, go play this game and tell me what you think. And that is, I was like, whoa, like I made a friend on the game. And uh, now like, if I need to do a collaborative mission, he's on the short list of people that I can invite and he will like always come and help me. Mm -hmm. So it's like, they figured out the gaming industry has figured out motivation, collaboration. They figured out skills acquisition in unique ways. Um, the closest platform to pulling this off right now is called Stimuli. Uh, it is uh, Dallas based, um, black owned, woman owned, amazing company. So big shout out to Taylor and the team at Stimuli. Uh, but they're building a an academic open world game that's fully customizable and content agnostic. So you can plug in basically anything to this. Hmm. Um, and um, and so, yeah, I hope the I hope the Edgeverse Metaverse for learning. I, I hope it's the worst thing. Maybe we can they do should is... they should come on this show. It'd be interesting to talk to them. Uh, I'll, I'll connect you. I, Thank you. Easy, easy connection. Um, we 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 talk on the regular. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I hope the I hope the Metaverse is more like a game and less like school. 
I think my nightmare. I'm all for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My nightmare is that you have a uh, virtual reality desk and rows. I think, I think I would. I think I that's would, what a lot of people, even with the office too, I think people are picturing, yep. well, we'll just be in our suit and tie and in our cubicles, but as avatars or something. And exactly. I think that's definitely a missed opportunity because there's so much more you can do. Um, so, I mean, what do you think is the, this is kind of a, a big picture question, but as someone who is, I'd say, an, an innovator, an influencer, an impactor in education, um, where do you see education going over the next, maybe it's hard to predict longer than this, or maybe the next 10 years? Uh, yeah. What do you think is the future? What do you think is the next step? Or what would you like to see happen? Um, I, I, there's a couple of things. In the next 10 years, I really want to see, number one, like first and foremost, uh, the thing on my mind is that I want to see the lines between uh, college and high school blurred. I I think there are some phenomenal companies out there, like um, like Factor is one of them. Uh, that is Factor is uh, founded by one of the Lambda School co-founders, um, and it, it's basically their focus is like, look, let's focus on uh, people ages sixteen to twenty one and give them so many different experiences in life that they know what they want to do and what they don't want to do, right? Like to me, that, that, that not only helps people save money, but, but um, I, I want to see this line blurred for a couple of reasons. One, because I think that the university system is, it is what keeps the K through 12 system from changing. Mm. And to some extent, if you ask people in higher ed, they will say, well, the K through 12 system is what keeps us from changing, right? And so I, if, if we're both pointing fingers at each other, I I'd rather just see those, like, what if your last two years of high school could in some way, like, mesh with what, what we knew of your first two years of college? Well, all, well, that's um, the thing. I mean, all of K through 12, especially high school, is is pretty much geared towards preparing you for college. Right. Exactly. And, and college has to deal with people who have been educated in high schools or K through 12 system. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's like a chicken or egg thing. Um, but yeah. So, so how, how do you think we could uh, change that? Oh, I, there's a number of ways. Um, one, one of them, I, 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 I can't even, I won't even get into it cause I can't. Um, I just, I, uh, part of it is because I don't, I don't, I don't know it as well. But, but there's a, there's a sneaker. It's brand. more than just college courses for. I mean, sorry, they have like college. You know, they have college courses in yeah. high school for credit. Like my wife did a lot of those, and I mean, right. those are those are great. That's a good first step. But I'm sure, obviously, there's got to be something more than that. Yeah, it's the creation of like literally new pipelines and pathways, right? Like, I, I, I don't want to uh, share too much, but I, I know that there is a sneaker brand that's based in New York based in Harlem. Uh, that's a, it's basically a creative agency that also has a brand. Um, and they're actually thinking about uh, new ways of getting people into the sneaker industry without college. Like it's, it's that to me, it's like, how do we, how do we allow people to quote unquote, skip steps to get to what they love? Like if I'm 16 and I know that I love designing sneakers, I should be able to do that. I shouldn't have to go get an industrial design degree so that I could maybe get hired at Nike. Like, this is a great a great example is like people may be shocked to know that a lot of the dopest sneakers on earth were designed by people who by day were working on refrigerators at lg like mm. that is crazy to me right yeah. it's there's this there's all these industries that are of interest to people videography photography if i love photography and i'm 15 years old i should not have to go to a stale university totally. so, that, so that i can get a piece of paper that says that i'm good at photography i should be able to maximize youtube and linkedin right this is why i love a person like peter mckinnon um and maddie hapoya the, the, these big youtube videographer photographers I, i've actually run this test with myself i love photos and videos as well um, never made it a career, never intend to make it a career. But I, my challenge that I've been secretly running is to figure out how good I can get by just watching Peter McKinnon videos. Like mm -hmm. not, no one else. Like I do watch other people, but when I go in like learning mode, I only watch Peter McKinnon videos, the way he makes things. Um, I, it's also because I, I am obsessed with Canon cameras and so is mm -hmm. he, but um, like the tutorials that he does, I want to see how far I can get. 
gotten pretty far from where, where you I can learn so much on youtube i've learned to cook right. i mean like you know that's anything uh, yeah i'm learning so how to I, edit video and audio from it yeah yep and so i hope that revolution right is the thing that blurs because if i want to this is why tiktok as a search engine is, is so important if i want to learn how to fix my sink two years ago i go to youtube and I'd listen to Dave, who's been fixing sinks for 20 years. And he would tell me that at the beginning of the video. And it wouldn't be until like the 11 minute mark that Dave would tell me how to actually fix this. Fix right. The sink. Or you drag to the part where it might say, this is where you talk. We talk about this. Yep. You know? Yep. Yeah. Not anymore with TikTok. Right. I can figure that out in 30 seconds. Like I, I, I love that about the way that the internet is revolutionizing learning. Mm -hmm. I just hope that universities and K through 12 schools. I hope they take that ride instead of getting left behind because that's what's always happened. Like education, we've always been left behind. It, it's a it's a big dinosaur, um, you know, probably one of the most conservative industries and they often don't, they, they, you know, they often are quick to see the negative, like, oh, kids are playing on their phone. They're playing video mm -hmm. games, wasting their lives. They're, they're uh, you know, doing stupid things on TikTok when they're missing the, the, the point that these things could be used uh, as powerful learning and, and, and bite-sized learning, quick learning tools, that they, they can be much more yeah. engaging um, and they should be learning from it, how to adapt to keep users, their students engaged and yeah. able to learn. Um, that's fascinating. Uh, where, where can people find you, follow you, uh, learn more? Yeah, find find me on LinkedIn, Mike Yates. Um, I have a website <laughs> that I like hardly keep up with. I need to keep up with it. Uh, that's yatesmike.com. That's like if you want to ever book me to speak or anything like that, you can go to that website. Um, but really, just LinkedIn DM um, or TikTok. I'm enjoying. I'm having a lot of fun on TikTok. I yeah, what's I your see TikTok you on there handle? Too. Uh, it is at just Mike Yates. Okay, cool. Yeah, I actually I think myself I just, just started making some more videos there. Um, I was actually telling CPAs to join this like four years ago. I was like telling them to do, you know, so it's, yeah, it's I mean, how it's picked up. Um, like Duke loves taxes. That dude just revolutionized. Like he just is using TikTok to re revolutionize his own business. Um, but also like the yeah, so CPAs, listen, get on there. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right. Well, thank you so much, man. This was great. We'll have to yeah. have you on again soon. I'd love to come on anytime.